This is Sarah Milligan with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. Um, today's date is, I think I should have looked at this before, it's March 5th? 5th? 8th. 8th. Oh my gosh, <laughs> the time work. March right. 8th, 2016, which I still want to say 2015. <laughs> I know what, uh... 2016. Um, I'm in Granite, Oklahoma. I'm here with Brenda Hickerson. Um, we are doing an interview for the Cowboy in Every County Oral History Project, um, which is part of the O State Stories collection. Um, all right, now that that's out of the way. <coughs> all right, so let's just start with um, tell me a little bit about yourself, where you're from, um, who your family is, just a little bit about your background. Okay. Um, actually, our family uh, started in Stillwater. Um, oh, wow. My mom and dad met at OSU in the 1946 and uh, they were married and all of the children, my siblings and I were married, were born in Stillwater. So that was where we began. Wow, I didn't know that. Yes, and uh, dad was a, a small business entrepreneur there and so we all grew up, you know, around a small family business then. Actually, I didn't spend a whole lot of time in Stillwater in the beginning. I was about two and a half when they decided to move here. So we moved to Granite. So it's been a big, you know, back and forth here. That's a big shift. Yes. So did you have yes. siblings that were older than you? Yes. I had a sister that was a senior in high school. So she moved from Stillwater as a, as a, going into her senior year and moved to Granite, Oklahoma. Good and bad, both. You know, she was a little upset to begin with, but she made some lifelong friends here. So, you know, mm -hmm. it all turns out the way it's supposed to in the end. But, uh, so we grew up literally across the street from this plant, uh, where we work now. Family's in the monument business. We have quarry, uh, we process granite for a lot of different projects. And, uh, like I said, this was just in our blood. We grew up running through the plant. We grew up working in the plant and, and processing uh, monuments in some form or fashion. So that was, uh, that was implanted at an early age. We would hear mom and dad working with families, you know, because we'd be hanging out around the, the office. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it really, it does get ingrained in you dealing with people. And that's mm -hmm. probably the biggest uh, thing that we learned from watching our parents was how to deal with people, especially in times of need or if it's a civic project or anything like that. So anyway, we were, um, I was a shop rat. I I was literally under everybody's feet, you know, the whole time. Uh, but whenever, you know, small town granite, you decide you want to go away to college. And I was fortunate to have a scholarship to Western over here at Altus for the first year. I'd planned on going to Stillwater immediately, but I had a scholarship for basketball and music. So I went to Altus for one year and decided that I wanted to go to Stillwater the next. So that took me back to Stillwater. Mm -hmm. And of course we went, we, we had family connections all, all along, so we were always going back and forth, but Stillwater's where I had to go myself. I wanted to go to that Stillwater. It was your choice, OSU. not, yeah, not no necessarily pressure choice. from... Correct. No, no pressure there. That's, I just always knew that's where I wanted to be. Um, well, I do want to come back to that, but I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, when you all, when you're... So tell me a little bit more about what your dad was doing in Stillwater and how that transition came from Stillwater to Granite. He was actually, he and mother were in school there. Mm -hmm. they, they went to OSU. Um, dad was the in architecture and mother was uh, studying physical education. Hmm. She was the queen of Murray Hall and he was the sophomore uh, president, class president. And so they crossed paths eventually. And uh, I don't know how much you want to get into that, but mother had done a... a uh, written her life story for her English class, and Dad had been after his friend to introduce him to Mother at Tiger Drug on OSU campus. And so finally the time came, and Mother happened to be carrying her life story with her whenever they met. And so they sat down in a booth, and Dad was wanting to know what she was carrying. She said, it's my life story. So he sat there and read it, and he goes, every girl needs to carry one of these. So they were married three months later. <laughs> 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 what did she get to read his life story? Oh, he, he, he just verbally did that with her, I'm sure. So anyway, so, uh, you know, the campus has a real special, mm -hmm. special um, meaning for all of us. But so they, um, it was during the war. They actually had to keep that they were married silent because 
they would be kicked out of housing. <laughs> so three three couples eloped to Kansas, and mom and dad were one of the three couples, and they attempted to live apart, married on campus because of the housing issue during the war and everything. So they uh, finally uh, succumbed to admitting it, and so they bought a little trailer that they moved in off campus that they lived in for the mm -hmm. first. So uh, I forgot what question you asked. I'm just getting there. Yeah, no, it's totally about. fine. Okay, that's the good way okay. to go, actually. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> good. So anyway, um, Dad, uh, my grandfather owned the quarry down here. He had actually done WPA work as an engineer. And he had seen the the, uh, the uses for the material. He was from Granite. He grew up here. And so he, uh, whenever the pouring was up for sale in the processing plant, he purchased it. And at that time, my dad had put in a little manufacturing shop in Stillwater. And it was a little, uh, we did a little bit of everything. He did all the awnings in Stillwater, my dad. You know, those metal awnings and the metal fencing and everything. That was him. That was us. And also uh, Venetian blinds. So that was the beginning of that. Well, when Grandpa bought the core and the processing plant, they started investigating different ways that the granite could be used. And so Dad also put in a monument company in Stillwater at that time. Ta-da! So, yeah. uh, as time went on, Grandpa needed more assistance down here. So that's what transplanted us from there. So... So he was already in the business yes. there as well. Yes, exactly. So if it wasn't for OSU, we wouldn't be here today, <laughs> to say the least. And Mom and Dad uh, didn't finish their degree there and everything, but they were they were devout. Mom, Mom would know all the football players' names, what they did in each game, the basketball players. She was just a she she was the uh, all encompassing. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, can't think of the time. <laughs> fan. I'm a super fan. Uh, fan, super fan, yes. So how and, far did they get in their education then? Uh, Dad was a junior and Mother was a sophomore. So they, you know, they went the two years. Once they got married, it was a little tougher to continue in school. So they decided they'd try their hand at being an entrepreneur. So. And we've done that ever since. <laughs> <laughs> so you're... you're Dad grew up in Granite, is that he, correct? Mangum and Granite. He actually graduated from Mangum, which is a few few miles away from here. Mother grew up, was born in Dustin, Oklahoma. And Granite's on one end of Highway Nine, and Dustin's on the exact opposite end of in Highway the Eastern Nine. Part of yes, the state. she's um, Half Creek, mm -hmm. and uh, she went to a boarding school in Chilocco whenever she was twelve. Her mother died when she was 12, and so the Shilako was a school that would take in orphans or half-orphans and, and everything. So she had six, bro five brothers and sisters, and they were all living with their grandparents uh, with other family members. And so there were 17 people in a two-room house. So she went to Shilako, and she was valedictorian of her class. And uh, she had always wanted to go to OSU, so that was her, that was her uh, dream. To go to college. So. Did she talk much about it? Was it was it difficult to get to OSU, or was it? Um... You know, that's really strange. She worked. A, she did work a year for uh, AT and I mean AT and T <laughs> for the telephone company mm -hmm. uh, to earn money to be able to go to school. So you know, back then, she probably didn't have much direction in how to obtain a way to go to and in fact I don't know if they even had anything like scholarships or anything I think you just paid your way and that was it so but she did work for the telephone company and uh, basically put herself through those two years so mm -hmm. you know that's quite an accomplishment in my eyes it's they, incredible. they didn't finish so I mean that's all right <laughs> but they always instilled it to us to, to uh, that we needed to go to college. There was never any doubt about that, for me anyway. What was yeah. the, I wonder that too, because you said she knew she wanted to go to OSU, mm -hmm. and, and I hear people say that pretty often. I wonder if, if there was a reason behind that. Family, uh, her uncle was the most avid OSU fan. <laughs> uncle, his name was Jim Fife, and he was a staunch OSU uh, person. And I don't know, it's really strange. You know, I never really asked that question. I just assumed that, you know, we were in the area and everybody else was OSU fans in the family. So 
uh, he played, uh, I, I can't tell you whether he attended or not, I, can't, I should know, but he was a, he played football and I believe did track. Um, you know, he was uh, quite an influence that was part of the family that raised her mm -hmm. whenever she, because uh, her daddy went to California to drive a, to be an engineer. And that literally left all those children there. She was the oldest of the six, so it just left all the children there to be taken care of by various family members. Quite a, it's a, if you ever want to do another story, the, the Awathali, um Indian Church is where she uh, grew up, the tribal town, that's where the name came from. And uh, it's a remarkable family there. <laughs> the, uh, most of her uh, relatives have uh, gone on to, um, a lot of them went to Santa Fe for the art uh, training there, mm -hmm. and they're very um, well known in the Native American art area and writing also. So mm -hmm. I don't know, interesting side of the family. That is interesting. Yeah, and then Daddy, he was the exact opposite. He was uh, he grew up. Grandpa grew up dirt poor and uh, in granite. He got his engineering degree by correspondence course. He only went through the eighth grade and then he got his, you know, went, got his other uh, certifications with his engineering degree was correspondence actually from OU. <laughs> <laughs> he was number, number 63. Yeah, he was number 63. And so dad grew up on the other end of that spectrum. He uh, was number 63 for what? Engineer, civil engineer of Oklahoma, number 63. He was, he just was the 63rd. <laughs> That's that pretty cool? early, yeah. yeah. Isn't that cool? That's what I that, I haven't documented that, but that's what I've always been told. And um, anyway, Dad had um, contracted osteomyelitis when he was twelve. He um, they had been to the World's Fair. Grandpa took them everywhere. World's Fairs, everything. They'd get in the car and they'd go. Red River. I mean, they were just they were the opposite of Mother's family. Completely opposite. But Dad got osteomyelitis and he almost died when he was 12. And Grandpa had been reading in Reader's Digest about sulfa drugs. And it was the new thing. And so he and the doctor got in a plane and flew, I don't know where, to pick up sulfa drugs to bring back because they had amputated Dad's leg three times. And the, it would still come back. The, the osteomyelitis wouldn't, it wasn't ceasing. But the sulfa drugs, uh, cured him through Reader's Digest. Now that's a that's strange, but that's the way it happened. So, um, but Dad was the president of his class. He was the they Grandpa was in ham radios. He hooked up a ham radio for his room to where he could give his uh, freshman class address because he was a president of freshman year and he couldn't leave the house. But he went through like ninety six surgeries over his lifetime from the osteomyelitis. So, you got somebody that was flying all over the place, <laughs> so, you know, going to World's Fairs, and you had Mother here who had literally just scraped and everything. So, um, Mother appreciated my grandfather's history and my dad. My dad was tenacious, very tenacious. He, would, he was a dreamer. He would, you know, was just always on go, wanted to be involved in everything. And so uh, they were just a good pair to come together. Boy, I got off on food. No, oh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's really interesting, though. Well, and, and you even think about that, because this was in the 40s, right, when yes. they met. That's what you yes. said. Uh -huh. And so it's, it's interesting that with your dad at that time point, you know, just, and he was, he had, was one. down one limb, right? right. Uh-huh. Um, I I wonder how, like, if that sort of played a role in, in some how he, yeah, what, it, his life. Yeah. yeah. Oh, definitely. He, uh, he, Grandpa always said that. To give you an idea about Dad, Grandma had to tie him to the porch when he was two because he kept <laughs> escaping. He'd go to. It was all family around the area, town here. Uh, he had his little hour gang, you know, Spanky and the gang. Well, they, he had, I'll show you a picture later. It's all of them. They look like just like the hour gang. Anyway, they would go house to house to house and just run all over the mountain. They'd run all over town, you know, cousins and friends and everything. 
And Grandpa actually said, you know, if, if he hadn't have lost his leg, there probably wouldn't be anybody able to stand him because he was just so wired. He was everywhere, you know, I just slowed him down just enough to where he, would, he could be tolerated by most human beings. So that was interesting. And one thing about Dad is there was a young man, uh, a young boy that lived down the street, and his mother was always after him to go visit that Willis kid because he hadn't had, he'd been in bed for two years, you know, probably doesn't have any friends and everything. And Troy is his name. Troy goes, I don't want to go visit that old, uh, that snobby kid, <laughs> you know, basically. And uh, she goes, Oh, you get over that. You go up there and you visit. And so he went in. And the dad was laying in bed, and Troy went upstairs and said, Hey, and dad popped up, and he goes, He's 12. And I said, Want to play chess? And they were closer than brothers from then on. Troy would actually pack his wounds, dad's wounds, and, and be kind of a nursemaid for him during that wow. time. And so, all those experiences, I mean, those, I mean, who would do that for you? A strange, I mean, he didn't really know Troy from. You know, he Troy was a few years older, uh, but uh, to have someone come in and actually, he said, once he asked me to play chess, and we sat down and we talked about everything under the sun, about science and engineering and aircrafts, and, you know, they were just inseparable until uh, Troy went off to war, and you know, anyway, he even moved back down here when they were older, and they had a little time together before Troy passed away. So yes, Dad definitely his leg did uh, play a role in his how he thinks about things and his excitement for life. He would hit the door and it would be, "Good morning, isn't it a wonderful day?" I don't care what was going on. <laughs> you know, some days you're going to go, Pew. <laughs> you know, cut it down a notch, please. You know, it would be nice for you to just you know bring it down a little. But anyway, he was always on the go, always looking for new projects. He was always trying to invent something. <laughs> but the granite business was his heart because he, the idea of leaving something behind just the average person could see mm -hmm. and read about something that happened to a person or a place or whatever. And he and Mother both felt that way. So that's what was passed on to us and how we all got back involved in the, in the business here. So. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. So, when they when they came back down here and brought mm -hmm. you with them, and you were two, mm -hmm. so you really grew up around this. What mm -hmm. did did your siblings have the same connection to the business here as you did? Yes, because we all, uh, even though they were older. Yes. Uh huh. Karen might not have as much, uh, but we all worked in what we call the layout room. Uh, Karen and Linda and my brother worked various jobs around the office. We also had cable TV systems. Dad and Mom had cable TV systems with my grandfather and the family business. Grandpa uh, ran a wire up on the mountain because his house was just at the bottom of the mountain. And so it gave him TV, but when people heard about that, they said, Oh, can you do that for us? <laughs> so that was kind of the first uh, cable TV in the area. And so they, over time, they had purchased a small cable TV deal. Mm -hmm. So there's a little old building up north of here that just looks like it's fixing to fall in. It has a new roof on it because we're trying to save it. But that was the office for like 12 cable TV systems and Willis Granite Products <laughs> Monument Company. And so we kind of exploded out of that and built this eventually so that we could all have some space to, to work. Oh, it's a nice building. So that was the first one was just up north of here. Yes. And it was uh, probably put there in 1902, 1903. We have some pictures of it that's pretty neat. Cool. Uh, yeah, oh, when it was originally there. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. So, I, I, and I love the fact that you have all these pictures in here too mm -hmm. of um, all sorts of things. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And behind you is the Stillwater sign. The, one of the oh. first projects we did uh, when John and I moved back was that. That yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah the, that's the it. big one. The big one. Well, and there was a Perkins. little one on yeah. There was a little one on Sixth Street, uh, coming into town before you turn on Hall Hall of Fame. Uh huh. Uh, but they put that in storage supposedly when they widened the road. But yeah, we, that was one of the first projects we all got to work on because it was just a few years after I'd graduated and and. 
we'd actually bought into the business in 1983, all of us as a family, mm -hmm. and I was still in school, and so uh, it was just that was part of the intrigue to have your own business and come back and see what if you could help build it. So yeah, that was part of it. So the picture so, is all of you. Yeah, uh, the people that own the newspaper. Oh, that name's Bellati. Bellati. Uh, Mr. Bellati's, uh, there's, there's a gentleman, I can't remember his name, my mother, my dad, Mr. Bellati, uh, a young a woman that was, I think, part of the chamber, my sister Linda, uh, the other two gentlemen, I can't remember, and then me, myself and Karen. So those are my oh, three yeah. sisters. That's from left to right. I'll yeah. take a picture of that. So. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And you notice the dresses. So oh, that was <laughs> you know it's the 80s. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. So that was fun. That was one of our... And actually one of the first uh, projects that I got to be a part of was uh, the Oklahoma entrance sign at Theta Pond. Mm -hmm. I was still in school then, and so we all got to go to the dedication and take part in that, which was really cool. That That's was cool. Nice. Yeah. Uh, well, now when I go over there now, I'm going to have to look at it in my it, context. <laughs> <laughs> um... Well, so your family bought into the, this business in the 40s then? Yes. Yeah, Grandpa bought his first quarry about 1945. Mm -hmm. <coughs> this, one, this one he purchased, I think, probably 46, 47, something like that. Um, but the business itself has been here since the turn of the, since 1890s. Uh, the quarry first opened up here. In fact, I just found a picture. I was sitting there... Uh, some people send us pictures, and I pulled it up, and I looked out my office window, and it was the same, the mountain range, the, there's a boulder that's still there, and it's in this picture, and this picture has to be in the 1890s, the ladies have long dresses with bustles on, mm -hmm. you know, type mm -hmm. of thing, but it's in the quarry, and it shows, we have a wall of the original plant that's still up, and I'm thinking that this was part of this building that's shown in the picture, but the map, it was out my window, it was, that, was, that was a strange feeling. Bizarre to have yes. it just framed exactly yeah, right. There. right. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's yeah. pretty cool, though. Yeah, I'll, just, I'll see if I can pull that yeah, up. Yeah, that'd be but, neat. Anyway. I, well, anyway, yeah. It's, <laughs> well, and so I wonder... So you you said that he bought his first quarry in 1945 and then this one in 1946. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. got him into the quarry business? Do you know? Well, he was working with WPA. My grandfather. Oh, you said it. Yeah. yeah, I was working with WPA, and he was the engineer for like the schools that are made out of local material. And he did our drainage ditch here in town, which is about oh, I don't know five feet deep, granite lined, and it comes off the mountain. And there's several. Um, several canals of it throughout town that actually takes all the drainage out. So he had worked on a number of projects in the area with the granite and that's what uh, got him interested in purchasing the plant and the uh, projects. Yeah. So. so he got comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. was, oh yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, most definitely. <laughs> that's a big undertaking. That's pretty neat. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so, and I wonder that too with you growing up here and then right, let's get back to your decision to go to OSU, you mm -hmm. said that that was something you always knew, I mean, is, is that something, is, did your siblings go there, is it, was it a family thing, or was it a you thing? At, well, our, my, Karen went to school there for a couple of years, for two years, she didn't finish her degree, but she was there, and then uh, Linda actually went to school, she was living in South Central Oklahoma, so she went to school at Durant mm -hmm. for a few years, and she was in arch engineering, mechanical drawing type things. Karen, uh, I don't know if she ever... Uh, declared a major or anything, but other, other life's decisions came in, and so they didn't finish. Uh, my brother, uh, he really wasn't the college type, I'd say. He liked working with his hands, welding, things like that, so he, he did his own thing, more or less. And me, I was the one that we'd been trained. <laughs> they had really uh, put their mark on me going to school. I mean, I knew I was going to college. That just wasn't a question. And OSU was my pick over everything. Like I said, if it hadn't been for the scholarships at Altus, I would have gone up mm -hmm. there first year. But anyway. Is that, what do you think that that draw came from? Was it because of the academic programs you thought you would get? Or was it because of the connection with the family or other things? I knew the academic aspect of it would be a challenge for me. 
because I was coming from a small school. Mm -hmm. and, and that was another thing that took me to junior college to begin with because it really, it was a daunting thing to think of going to Stillwater with. I mean, I had 30 kids in my senior class. I mean, I think we finally graduated with 28. <laughs> we started with 32, graduated with 28. So, um, and, you know, there were always uh, colleges that came down and give a talk and everything. Nothing like it is now. From what I understand, there's a lot more um, individual attention to okay, what are your what are you wanting? What are your needs? You know, we have that. This is it. I was kind of out there. I like everything. I like music. I like art. I like <laughs> geology. I like science. I had I had not pinpointed exactly what I wanted to pursue. Except I started in music because I really thought that was going to be my what I wanted to do was be something in music, and um, when I went to OSU, it was a stretch for me in that regard because I'd taken piano lessons twelve years. <laughs> you know that was about the basics of it because it and we had a few vocal we had vocal and you know music at school. Um, so when I went up there, that was that was a big, uh, it was a culture shock for me, you know, just in that that venue, that in the music, music department. department, yeah. So I enjoyed all of it. Uh, scared me to death to get up in front of all those people and you know do anything, but uh, that was that was a good thing. I took a geology class, and it just hit something. I mean, I just really thought I could get into this. And so, um, plus, growing up here, I mean, it might surprise you, I was a rock nut. I like picking up rocks and minerals and things like that. So that was uh, always something. I mean, I, we ran on these mountains, and you'd see something, and you'd go, oh, my gosh, what is that? It was just really neat to see the differences in the granite. So I guess maybe that's where I was trending all along. And so I switched to geology, and that's where I finally got my degree in. And uh, well, and, and I, I well, yeah, it makes total sense. But I, and I think it's hard sitting in this office. It's hard to understand not not having walked in the building. Like mm -hmm. if someone hadn't walked in the building with me to understand that you are backed up against like it. it it's a mountain. Yes. I know it's, <laughs> it's a hill. It's a hill Granite technically, hill. but it's Granite hill. Yeah. yeah. And the interesting thing about this area of the state is, you know, you have super, super flat and these just like juts up, yes. right? It's just like yeah. pop, pops up. Um, and this is what struck me as I came into town. Have and you I'm been sure, here before? No. Southwest Oklahoma at all? Yes, okay. I have Southwest okay. Oklahoma. Okay. Um, not to grant though, mm -hmm. what was interesting to me is you roll into town and it is basically this hill. So, yes. like, the town is <laughs> sort of clustered around this hill. So, yes. it, it, it's, uh -huh. it seems to me it would be present, very present in everything you do. Yes. It was me. Because another thing Mom and Dad did, Dad said this was the Garden of Eden. And I said, I think that's a little maybe over, you know, overstated. But <laughs> when you drive up and you see those mountains, that is an effect. That is home. You know, Stillwater's my other home. I feel the same way when I go, you know, head head back that way. But, but the mountains are, I mean, it really, literally, like you said, it looks like it's just enveloping the town. It just kind of hugs it, and uh, it it that's part of you if you ever if you grew up around here. I think. And I wonder about that too. It, it, did the town grow around the quarry, or did the quarry come up where there was a town? The town was established in 1900, so before statehood. Actually, the first people that came through here were with cattle drives. And um, Quanta Parker, uh, there was a man named George Briggs who had the cattle outpost just up north of town here. So that was actually the first thing that came in. The Pella brothers that operated the quarry from the 19, early 1900s until Grandpa bought it, they were, came over from England. And they started, uh, they came from England to Vermont, you know, up northeast area, and they were working there, and they decided they had heard that there was uh, granite in Oklahoma. And so they, those people from England, 
got on a train or a wagon or whatever and ended up in Oklahoma and started quarrying and processing, which is their trade in England. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, like all those wanting a better life mm -hmm. story and yeah. wanting their own, something they can have and hold and, and work in. Um, and we still had contact with the Pello family, and the, there is a, still Pellows in Enid. There's a monument company in Enid, they're a Pello family, but uh, a lot of them, Pello, Pellows and Penhalls, they all lived here, and uh, some of the their heirs contact us every now and then, so that's really kind of kind of neat mm -hmm. to keep that up, too. That's neat. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, uh, so a little bit of cattle farming, a little a little bit of quarrying, and that's what makes the, made the community. Right, and farming, of course. Right. The community itself was probably heavily uh, populated, I know it was, from people coming from Tennessee and Kentucky. Mm -hmm. The train came through here, and they heard there was land, and they landed here. Grandpa came when he was um, four years old with his mother. It's another different, unusual story, but anyway, they came and her family had settled here to farm, and one was a doctor, and uh, one was a had a store. John Willis is on top of City Hall. He had the buggies, wagons, and implements store, <laughs> and you could still see the lettering on the building. So when we were trying to redo our downtown, they decided they'd just repaint that in. So it's got on our City Hall. It's got John Willis buggies, wagons, and implements <laughs> on the front of our city hall. So anyway, long, long history. That makes more sense to me now because I did drive a little bit around. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We were trying, I mean, you know, uh, the city uh, planning commission is trying to come up with things to kind of keep a little of the old, because, uh, you know, we're losing a lot of buildings, so I'm trying to keep what we can. You can tell. I mean, you can tell that there's been an effort put in. I was an effort. Yes. Yeah, no, <laughs> I mean, effort. Yeah, big effort. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You have to be uh -huh. systematic about it. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, well, that's, that's very cool, actually. So it was you. Your family has a deep connection to the. I mean, you said that they were here, but that's mm -hmm. a deeper connection yes. than just yes, yes, landing. Uh -huh. Right. Um. <coughs> so I guess. Because I'm now I'm bouncing around everywhere, but you were talking about that you ended up getting a degree in geology. Mm -hmm. um, maybe let's talk a little bit about what that process was like. Did you feel that that was challenging? Did you enjoy very it once you started it? it? I enjoyed it. I really did. Uh, very challenging. I was a little bashful, so the whole college experience was a uh, pushing myself out there to, you know, and whenever you're a music major for two years not much transfers and whenever um you know and my and my counselor bless his heart he tried to tell, keep me in the music lane because <laughs> um everybody thinks geology and they think oil well, oil was taking a nose dive like right now at that point in time and he really 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 i'll, I'll give credit to him all <laughs> he really tried to you know show me what possibilities I have, and, you know, versus the other, but that um, the grittiness of studying the, the earth and the geology and everything really uh, overshadowed everything at that point. Um, it was very challenging, very challenging. Uh, I had to make up a lot of the math, you know, things that you wouldn't necessarily have to have with music. I had to do that in a little, <laughs> well, Still took me four years. I had to do that in a sped up way. Um, I was a, a member of FIMU when I first went up there. And um, at that time, I'd already met my husband. <laughs> oh, another OSU yeah, connection. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, he wasn't an OSU connection, but uh, I took him to OSU. Uh oh, well, I got it. Yeah, yeah, got it. <laughs> and he had already graduated actually from uh, Weatherford. Mm -hmm. And so um, when we met, we uh, I lasted a year and a half before we got married. So anyway, I had a married. I was married most of the time I was in college, mm -hmm. and um, still searching whether I wanted to be a teacher or what aspect of geology I really wanted to pursue. I loved I loved all of it. It's just I didn't want uh, the 
specifics of a sand grain bouncing down the, you know, the minutia of some of it I wasn't all that thrilled with. It was, you know, it was, like I said, a challenge. Geology camp was an eye-opening experience. We went to Canyon City for six weeks in the summer. That's what they still do, I believe. They were given a donation. The, I believe the land's been donated by now. But uh, we uh, went there and mapped and got caught in hailstorms. and It was amazing. <laughs> so what was eye-opening about it? Um, actually getting out and, and seeing things in the in, for real and being able to uh, attempt putting a story to it, you know, laying that down, uh, the historical story of the formations and stuff, and seeing how much you don't know <laughs> when you get out there and are trying to really make it make it work. Um, I don't know. It was just a, it was an eye-opening experience just just being out in the environment like that and, and having a project that you were going to begin and finish, you know, mm -hmm. uh, during that time frame. Working with other people, uh, different personalities, uh, being, uh, pushing myself again. I had mm -hmm. to really push myself to get involved in that. But everything that happened at Stillwater, uh, I could see how it, impacted where I am and the things I do now or have done in the, mm -hmm. you know, in the, since I've been back home. Mm -hmm. uh, Did you feel like because you had this history here mm -hmm. that when you started doing geology did you feel like you had a leg up or a curve or do you feel a little confident? Not really a leg up or anything. I mean it, the Probably gave me more confidence than any other uh, study I would have done, just because I was familiar uh, with the product. Um, whether that came through in, you know, in, in the classwork classroom, I don't know, but it was uh, I don't know. It was a heart thing, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm, I I love the granite. I love studying the history, you know. Uh, geological history and things like that so um, not really I don't know if it really gave me a leg up or not they probably thought it was weird <laughs> I wasn't oil you know I really wasn't, uh, wasn't going for oil or anything like that so it was, it was a little different that's what I was saying I, I, I debated on teaching or doing something along those lines because um, I found out later when we give tours and things through here, that's one of the highlights is being able to tell them about it, you know, and why we do things the way we do and, and, and how the granite's formed and, you know, things like that. So, anyway, I'm kind of circled back around. No, I, actually, that's one of the questions I had because, you mm -hmm. you know, the mentioning that you thought you might teach or you might do something else, my mm -hmm. assumption would be when you chose that that, that would be to come back here and put that knowledge to work here. But mm -hmm. it sounds no, like geology. You, yeah. yeah, we toyed a little bit in the quarry with that, but for uh, some of the OU and OSU's geology departments would come down and we'd go up and they'd look at they'd do you know research and things like that on the area to to better understand the Wichita's. So that was exciting. Um, I got off track from that because. This is a specific business, you know, and you do use different granites or what they call granites in this industry, um, but it wasn't the main focal point. I mean, I really got shot off into another world <laughs> when you're coming back here because the, the thing about, I didn't think I could work in a cubicle. I really didn't. It just didn't seem like... I liked here because you were in the office, you were out in the plant, you were on the mountain, you were, you know, there was a lot going on and it wasn't just one, you know, thing, uh, you know, on a computer screen. Um, so when I said I had a lot of interests, I guess this was the perfect place for me to end up <laughs> because I wasn't pigeonholed into one thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of us, it's really strange, all of us have a different... Uh, 
strength that we brought back here. And of course, you know, you get all that from your previous life experiences. And so I know that uh, I know that going to OSU helped me to see um, dealing with people. You know, I had to grow in that area. And boy, when you get shoved out and you're bashful and you're trying to stay afloat, you know, you, you see and, uh, you know, I might not have handled those, some of those things real well, but now I can see that it's helped me here. And we get, you know, we work with cities, we work with um, uh, communities, I mean, communities and colleges and things like that on projects. But the majority of us in here talking like this with people. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's about something they don't, never wanted to talk about, but it gives them, a, that's, I think that's what drew us all back here, because we might not have known it at the time, but hearing mom and dad visiting with these people and trying to help them, that, that kind of was the most important part, mm -hmm. you know, um, so, and I don't, uh, when someone's in here at, looking for a monument, and you think that'd just be horrible and that'd be the worst thing in the world to do, but the horrible things already happen, and this is something they can do. And they come in here, and nine times out of ten, we'll leave here laughing because they're telling stories and they're reminiscing, and you know, we're trying to come up with something that shows what that person was and who they were and they existed. You know, and they had a family, and they had a life, and uh, so that's uh, just, that's the, I think that's the most important thing that drew us all back here. Even though that I never wanted to talk to people. <laughs> I wanted to do the work. I didn't want to talk to people. But you get drawn into that because you're, you're all, if you're working out there, working in here, you're all after the same uh, goal. Mm -hmm. Well, and I wonder that, too, because um, how far does your business reach out? Like, I know you do local business, and you do mm -hmm. things like memorials and personal monuments, mm -hmm. but you also do for businesses and cities, like you mm -hmm. mentioned. Um, how far is the business draw for you? We, most of the state of Oklahoma, uh, usually about a 300 radius of granite, because we do have all hands-on right here. We do all the work here, and that way we can control how things go out. Um, we do a lot in the panhandle pan of Texas. We go into Texas. Sometimes we go up into the uh, southern part of Kansas. But we have pieces all over the world. Um, we have a historical in uh, Foppenhop in France. And we used to go to the state fair, and this gentleman came by, and he was part of the cactus division that liberated Pfaffenhoff in France and he found out that we could do the work here and ship it to France cheaper than having it done over there because of taxes and he thought it was cool that it would be Oklahoma granite and so we were working on this project and a little gentleman that lives a block over that way came in and he was looking at it and he goes that's my division <laughs> it was like wow this is a small world so uh, that was cool. I mean, he came and watched as we were making it. So anyway, he'd come and he'd visit and watch as we were making this. And the bronze came in to be placed on it and everything. And he'd come over. It. So they had a little mini um, reunion as we were making it over <laughs> during that time. Yeah. So I don't know. There's uh, different projects. Um, Oklahomans are scattered all over. And uh, we've taken, uh, or people have taken our work to Africa to celebrate Lord Baden-Powell. We did a portrait of him to be taken to Africa. He was the founder of Boy Scouts. Mm -hmm. And a gentleman in Oklahoma City was very big into Boy Scouts, and he commissioned us to do that. And another gentleman uh, had um, ties with the Aleutian Islands, and we commemorated a, a place in the Aleutian Islands for the services. Um, anyway, it's it's uh, interesting. So you're asking how far we go out. Well, we typically we go Oklahoma, Texas, and a little bit of Kansas. Mm -hmm. But we've we've done. I'm gonna get the number wrong. Fifty historicals in Tennessee, commemorating C Civilian Conservation Corps uh, projects. 
and we'd go set those. <laughs> we'd make them and take them out. So you drive them out and, and set them up? Yeah, and set them up. And that was in the 80s, so we've done a lot of that. Uh, uh, and now with the internet, you never know where a request is coming from or you know where they need it to be mm -hmm. uh, installed. Or we've got some projects in Colorado that are, that are in process. So, you know. One of the things, and this leads to just me not knowing anything about this industry, mm -hmm. um, how, I guess I don't even have an idea of how many granite quarries there are out there in this region or in the U.S. Is it something that the, How does that work, I guess? Okay, the industry. There are yeah. there used to be uh, a number of quarries in this area. Uh, there was ours. There's one north of the mountain. There were uh, one on the west side here and another south. So there are probably, in my lifetime, five working quarries in this area. And, um, and then there's some scattered around the rest of Oklahoma, south central Oklahoma, Ada area, uh, Snyder. Roosevelt area. So there are other quarries that were in process. It's dwindled down to where there's only um, one. We're still a quarry we're not processing right now, but there's one processing north of the mountain, which gets similar granite, so we're utilizing them for right now. Um, the granite industry was a lot bigger industry before China, India, and the world trade started coming in. Uh, what they did, countertops. Well, just to give you an idea, when countertops came in, we used to have three colors. We had our red, mm -hmm. <laughs> we had a Georgia gray, and we had a black granite that was from Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Well, about 1990, um, foreign granite started hitting the market. And that was all fine and good. People kind of ignored them for a while, but then they really started uh, bringing in economical materials. And so that pretty much changed our domestic granite industry, period. You know, our convention went from having one young girl from China roaming the halls trying to get people to buy China granite so now, I bet it's over 50% foreign granites in our conventions now. I bet it's I bet it's gone over. You know, domestic. We cannot. Uh, a lot of the domestic processors quarries. And you have a quarry, and usually you have a wholesale monument company. And there's a lot of large. There's a lot. There's about four large companies that the that produce and put out the product for monument businesses. Uh, and um, they've even closed plants because they can't compete with the overseas market. So the world has come into Little Granite, Oklahoma. So now we offer all these colors <laughs> and uh, we try to offer unique things. And um, So do you all uh, import quarry then as well as what you quarry? When, whenever we were quarrying, we were actually shipping to Canada. We're not doing that now. It's just not feasible. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you what do you do? So we offer the, our customers what they ask for, and uh, you know we still have supply some supply of our granite that we we use for specialty projects and things like that. And like I said, we've got a block set up now. We're actually doing the wrestling hall of fame portraits. Uh, the saws sawing the slabs as we I mean I think for it's OSU? down today yeah for the national yeah at OSU mm -hmm. okay um, so um, anyway you we just had to be flexible with the market if we had banked everything on our own granite and pulling it out of the mountain processing it and everything we'd probably still we wouldn't be here because mm -hmm. things changed so much in yeah. the last twenty years so what. what 30 years. <laughs> I was about to say, yeah, you mentioned 20 years. At what point? So you all, you all stopped quarrying? Not, uh, about 2000, 2001 in there. And, uh, you know, it doesn't go bad. It's still there. It's just whenever, if the market ever turns around, then, you know, that's mm -hmm. going to be the consideration to open it up again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, you keep touching the table. Is this, yeah. is this Corey from your yes. back? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> from your Corey? Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. And that's, it's very red. You mentioned that too. Uh-huh. Is Oklahoma that? Oklahoma granite. It's kind of, it's uh, unusual. Uh, red granites are kind of 
rare. Uh, all of them have their own tendencies, so usually you can kind of look at it and say, oh, that comes from Africa, or that comes from India, or that comes from Oklahoma. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the color of it changes from here to there just a little bit, and uh, it, well, when you go through a quarry, you'll have uh, lighter, darker, you know, uh, material. Just depends on where you are in the quarry. Um, but I forgot what your question was. That was, yeah, I was just curious about, yeah, yeah, what, yeah. what comes from here and what, what the specifics and the differences this, are. Does that make sense? Okay, this comes from granite, mm -hmm. okay? That pink round piece there mm -hmm. comes came from um, Snyder. Oh, okay, they are different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, as you go through a mound complex, you'll have, uh -huh. you'll have changes. You can have a change from here to here. Uh, in one of the quarries over there, they have a... a what they called a blue granite, and it was really look, look black, and it was right next to something similar to that. So, um, you know, you get some interesting geological uh, formations around here. It's pretty cool. That is cool. Yeah. Hmm. So, you, your family, obviously, but you also have been around this business for, for a really long time. What are some of the I, I, you mentioned these changes as far as mm -hmm. the industry, right. but I wonder even as far as the processes and the technique, oh, yeah. what's what's changed over that period of time? It was so labor intensive. Um, I mean, if you wanted to um, cut a block, uh, and blocks are, what do we have here? This is the quarry wall, mm -hmm. and we had a picture of our diamond saw, but anyway, a uh, quarry block comes out about the size of a car. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you have to process it. Whenever we first came back here, we were using wire saws, and you can do a lot of cuts real quick, but your surface was very irregular. And then my grandfather had actually come up with an automated polisher, but they were using the huge metal wheels with little felt pads on it and everything. And so that was great, but whenever you had to get rid of all those ridges and everything, by the time you got it polished, you might start all over again because your polish didn't come out quite right. So it was not, it's become much more automated. Now we have a 90 inch diamond saw that does our cutting. We set it up, it'll go all night, you know, move from one slab to the other um, if we needed it to. Uh, polishing, it's all automated uh, again. So that part of it's amazing. The biggest part that we, that uh, my sisters and I, have taken part in is, uh, and Mickey was, well, uh, she was part of it. We used to have to do cookie cutter letters and we had to cut and stencil with a stencil on every single design that came through. So if you had the same flower on, uh, you know, you're sitting there cutting around it in the stencil work and everything. So um, the biggest, one of the biggest things is historicals and veterans monuments. Uh, whenever we were doing these cookie cutter mash into the stencil letters and everything or hand cutting them there would have been no way to economically or be able to do a 4,000, 10,000 name veterans memorial. I mean that would just be unheard of. Computers. <laughs> now we sit there and we can type in the lettering, the text, the design. We, we create designs in the computer. We can email them to our customers. They can email them back. Um, yeah, technology, laser etching, um, that's a sample there, and here's another sample of laser etching, mm -hmm. uh, where I hand tool portraits, or scenes, uh, that's the way we had to do them on, uh, whenever you wanted more of a photographic quality look mm -hmm. to it, rather than a hard line, you know, cut out look, um, I would do the portraits and the scenes by hand, we have a laser machine now, and it has a photographic uh, ability. It just doesn't take as long. <laughs> and it's more of a, it, mine looked more like a painting, I think, and laser is more of the photograph, mm -hmm. you know, on ground, so, so how technology. Did, when you did that all by hand, mm -hmm. it seems like you would have to have some artistic, at least, confidence. Yes, yeah. That's what's weird. I can't paint. I, I have never really felt comfortable getting colors out and painting. I mean, it just, and you'd think that'd be easier because once you take the granite off, the polish off the granite, it is gone. 
I don't know what it is. There's just something. Dad taught us. In fact, one of my very first portraits were uh, for the National Wrestling Hall of Fame when I was in school at OSU. We'd feel we'd help with the work as we could, and that was something I could do in school at Stillwater, do the drawings and everything, get them approved, and then they'd do them in granite here. But Dad taught us how to put artwork on granite, and the next step was to deter, I guess Linda and I pretty much just taught ourselves how to do the etch hand etchings on the granite. And, uh, you know, over the years you get better techniques and everything as you go, and I think, I think we, We've been pretty good on what we've, what we've, I'll show you some pictures later, but yeah. anyway. So hand etching, laser etching, uh, the computers to do the texts and the mammoth name, you know, and the approvals. <laughs> you know, letter, we, everything's letter by letter, by period, by comma, backwards and forwards to make sure we get everything correct before we put it on the granite. So computers have really, really opened up our business and that we can offer a little more economically for historicals for these small towns out in the areas where we're commemorating a high school that no longer exists, but people want pe people want others to know that it did exist, and this was the community, and these are the people that lived here, or you know, went to school here. So, <laughs> so how old were you when you did your first etch etch on a granite? Uh, the anything? the portraits. Um, See, we worked in the plant, doing the stencil and everything, but as for actually just taking the polish off with a tool, that was probably 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Wow. And my first little thing I tried was, we have, you know, up here we've got little blocks of granite everywhere, so I took a little piece and I, I tooled a pig. I mean, it was just a little silly thing that I did, and I did that, and I thought, well, I can do that. So then you move up and you do a marker or you do, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just a, it's just a learned thing. And, you know, you have to have a certain type of personality, I guess, to stand there and just take off, you know, yeah. flex of granite. What all happens day long. if you messed up? You polish it over. You polish it and start over. On the portraits, if you go slow enough, you can make corrections as you go. You don't want to drag all the polish off in one swift swoop. You know, you go a little at a time. And so you're able to make minute changes. And I'm looking at, you know, my nickel size area as I'm going. You know, I look at the whole thing, but, you know, as you're working, you're just looking at a small area. And by the time someone gets back and looks at the whole thing, it kind of pulls, it pulls together. So... That's a learned thing. That's yeah, that's why I think it's yeah. so interesting. That is a very specific <laughs> skill set to have. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but I did. I did take. I took some art classes at Stillwater, and our family is blessed with artists on both sides of the family. So I guess we have a little bit of it in our DNA. Yeah, you mentioned your mom's side of the family mm -hmm. specifically, and dad's too. Um, there's was. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's on both sides. There, there are working artists on both sides of the family, painting and murals and things of that nature. So, this is just really specific. That's interesting. I also think it's interesting you were doing some of the des like the original design work while you were in college. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I was saying. I don't know if I ever really had um, an opportunity to go into another vein because I was always. I mean, I. And I didn't mind. I didn't mind it. I mean, that was cool. That was the neat part of it. I, I couldn't have. When I looked at my dad and my mom doing their work, it's like, how do you do that? <laughs> you know, I mean, literally, how do you sit there and talk to somebody and draw out what they're telling you they want? <laughs> you know, that just seemed like it was not. You couldn't do that. Um, but uh, anyway, they, there was a there was a purpose to all that, <laughs> and, and it's kind of coming to fruition here. You know, with all of us working back here. So. Yeah. And do you feel like you can do that now? Sit there and listen and draw. Oh and yes. Be yes, reactive yes, yes. and all yes. that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, yeah, it's a learned trait too. <laughs> Just have to get in there and do it. Uh, you know, uh, some people can't. I mean, you know, we have we have 
uh, where you just list things, you know. But um, yeah, I'm I'm happy to say that I did finally figure out how that was done. <laughs> That's pretty neat. Uh, That's pretty neat. So the biggest biggest changes are technology. I can understand that. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. And just in what you're able Technology to and materials. Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't have seen this. You wouldn't have seen that for sure. You know, thirty years ago. Yeah, that was okay. mom and dad. That was just a, a, we. We didn't do laser etching for a long time, and we had other companies do it, so we had them do some samples for us. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had gotten to where that was such a something requested so often, and we wanted to be able to turn around to be better. So, eight years ago. We bought our laser machine, and that's why we're in that too. So, and it has a lot of uh, intricacies in and of itself, which are, were, was a shock. <laughs> what was on the learning curve with that? Uh, you have to be. You can do Photoshop, you know, Adobe Photoshop, and put things together, and they run off on paper, and they they look great. Well, in granite, it's not a white piece of paper you're working with, and so a lot of the granites have grain structures that make it different, and you have to be able to spot what will be a good candidate for laser etching and what won't be, because you will be disappointed if you know this. I would not use for a portrait this granite because mm -hmm. it has too big a grain structure, and you might have a big black spot right where you want a nice delicate feature on a face or something. You can use it, mm -hmm. you know, that's fine, but I've gotten a little pickier on what I want it, you know, how I want portraits to turn out and everything, so. Uh, and that's the one with all the seals on it that we're talking about. The one with all the seals on it, yeah, you see these black uh, mineral grains mm -hmm. in here. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing a real fine portrait, or if they're expecting a real fun portrait, you wouldn't want to use this because those black spots won't go away. I see what you're saying. When you're tooling as it and stuff. To, I see as it as there, opposed it's to that's, that's, that's real more fun, subtle. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So it just uh, depends on what you're looking for. But um, just literally getting to where you know how the laser reacts to different granite types and, and how you can get it to do what you want it to do. That's mm -hmm. the, and so I've sampled a lot, and you know, these are all samples of things. I try to run a sample before I do a monument just because I don't want to have to polish it and start over again <laughs> to say the least. You know the little buffalo back there those are all um, I didn't different. realize that was her Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, well it's what this industry calls granite. They're all igneous rock but the industry calls everything granite that's an igneous rock so that's my geology gets a little uh, uh, comes out on me sometimes whenever they're discussing materials, but that's all right. That's probably not a bad thing. Knowledge no, is great. Right. It's good. Yeah, it's all right. It's good. All good. <laughs> so do you all still give tours then of the area? You mentioned that you all at one point could sort of. We used to go tours. <coughs> there was a Girl Scout camp here. We'd have 400 Girl Scouts every summer come through and they'd make little plaques and we'd do all sorts of stuff with them. Uh, liability issues is kind of cut back on that. We Every, every now and then we will do uh, a senior group, a tour, if they call and set it up ahead of time or we know we have people to cover and everything, then we'll, then we'll do that. But we watch where we take them and everything because it's uh, the liability issues are the, are the worst part of it. We'll definitely bring them in here and show them what we do. And I have the laser machine in here now too, so that gives them a little bit of an idea of how things work. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I don't know. That's I'm not boring you to do. No, I'm not so. bored at all. In okay. fact, I'm. You know, my brain's sort of trying to to glob onto most of this. It's um, it's really interesting. And I also, I think it's also interesting, like the the the, the point where it shifted from. Um, I still think of the fact that I'm my assumption. These are all my assumptions. It's just when mm -hmm. you're, you're still in granite, that so much of that would be tied to the physical location. But I mean, I think that is more of the historic yes. association at this point. Mm -hmm. um, even though you're still you're still tied to the land, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. not not because of the quarry as much right. anymore. Right. Right. Yeah. And it seems like, but you're, it's also such a physical, physical space. I mean, your equipment is huge. Your, yes, <laughs> your yeah. raw material is huge. Oh, well, there's this, I'm looking right at it, the saw and the saw block. 
That's oh. a nine. That's a nine inch blade. That's a nine here. Uh -huh. And you know, we're our business never was set up for strictly like wholesale business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like a core in a processing plant. In the beginning, this place sold to families. Okay. Whereas a lot of the quarry processing plants are just wholesale, and so they make the same, they make widgets, you know, okay, they turn out a thousand blah blah blah, <laughs> you know, markers, okay, they turn out a thousand mark one right after the other. It's probably not a very uh, romantic term, I call us a job shop because people come in and they tell us what they think they want, we work with them, we, from the ground up we'll work with them to design it and make it and, and have it installed for them. So it, we're just a little weird. Uh, <laughs> um, not everybody has a quarry and a processing plant and a, you know, so we're a, we're a strange animal and I don't know if some of the industry really cared for that much all these years, but that's the way we were set up to begin with and it's just the way it's continued since the quarry was open. So, um, makes us a little different from other places. <laughs> well, it's also, it seems like it's allowed you to be uh, nimble yes. in the business model. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, most definitely. Yeah, we have to be nimble. But I mean, well, you, you know, people ask for things. I mean, you just um, you have to know you have to know where the trends are leading. But whenever the customers start coming in and asking for something, that's a pretty good key. <laughs> you know that you know things are changing, and and you mm -hmm. need to be able to offer what they want or need. What were some of the shifts with that 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 you can recall? Say that again. What were some of the shifts with those sorts of things, like? Things that customers have come in and you say, oh, granite time colors. to change. Oh, that granite was colors, good. remember that mm -hmm. we had three and then all of a sudden, well, the strangest thing happened. We sh this should have been the big key. We had a taxi cab sitting out here from Oklahoma, I mean, out of Oklahoma City for, for a full day. And it was full of people from Pakistan. And they wanted to sell us their granite that they were coring in Pakistan. They came in with all their samples. They spread them out. And they said, we heard that you might be someone that would help us get into the United States industry of granite. And they sat out there. If we came in, we talked to them and everything. That was just unheard of. When was that? That was probably in 1989, 1988, somewhere in there. Oh, it had to be, no, 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 it had to be in the early 90s because this we had this office. Uh, so in the early 90s. But this, out of the blue, this yellow cab pulls up in Granite, Oklahoma, from Oklahoma City. <laughs> so that's the only way they knew to get down here. Um, the things at that time, quality issues, you didn't know, you know, the kind People hadn't been coming in here clamoring for Pakistani granite from Pakistan, you know, <laughs> so yeah. we um, told them no thank you. But within five years, things were changing big time. It started, the countertop industry, I think, really kicked a lot of that off because people started seeing different materials that were used for countertops. Well, why can't I have a monument made out of that? That's just a little part of it. And then the, the industries from across, overseas just flooded the markets. You know, and uh, once people started seeing what you could do with, you know, China and India, these are ch from China and India, the black granites that mm -hmm. you use mm -hmm. for the laser etchings. There's, there's supposedly one quarry in, I don't, in the northeast that has this quality of granite. You need really get a good laser etching and everything, but I haven't found that in the monument side of it. Most of it in our part of the United States comes from China and India for the laser etchings and stuff, so. Uh, but yeah, there's trends that, you know, we should, we could have awakened to a little earlier, but, um, you know, it just seemed like so far-fetched. Why would we bring granite from Pakistan if we've got a quarry here processing it and our other granite comes from Georgia? Why in the world, you know, you'd think your transportation, you'd think everything would be, you know, not allow you to do that. So did you end up buying granite from Pakistan? Not through them. We actually have, uh, there are some companies that'll go overseas and do their research and look at all the China, you know, all the different companies. I personally think they probably all come from one, <laughs> one you know, there's one 
uh, vendor with many names. I think that's what it is. But anyway, um, we just didn't have the desire, I guess, to go search out our perfect you know, supplier. So the larger suppliers in the, in, in the United States had decided they were going to carry the other granites. So we uh, picked out the ones that we thought were offering the best quality and would guarantee that granite. If you bring in a container load of granite and half of it is cracked or fractured and everything, you have all the expense of getting everything back. If we work with a wholesaler that's going overseas and buying and coming back, then that makes a big difference. And we can go back to them and say, hey, this piece didn't work, instead of tracking over, you know. It, it, it's changed a lot over the years. We probably could go over there and do that now because it's such a... I mean, it is a set-up entity now. You're not going out and asking, hey, do you want to <laughs> do you want to supply us with your stone? You know, you don't have to fly to Pakistan, yeah, get a taxi cab, exactly. take it to the yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So yeah, we found out how to make that how to make that work for us anyway here. So. Yeah. So because it's been mentioned a couple of times, do you all do a lot of business with countertops, or is that a different part we of the industry? We used to. It's a different product production setup. Um, we actually. In the 80s, we did a, quite a few jobs, uh, pretty... All the uh, countertops in this room? Or all the, yes, yeah. yeah, all the countertops in here. Um, we did a fireplace for a doctor from Egypt, and he had King Tut's uh, uh, scene across the fireplace. We seemed to always, a lot of them had to have something special, you know, that they wanted on there. Uh, but we did a lot of countertops in this area during the 80s. Um, but when that countertop explosion hit, in Oklahoma City, our person that, that services our diamond saw said there were 250 companies that did countertops in Oklahoma City. And so the, you know, the uh, bottom line there kept dropping. <laughs> so it just wasn't feasible for us. I mean, we're here. We have to go measure, come back. You know, there was just a lot of things. And, and when they're set up for countertops, they just spit them out, you know. It's it's a different mechanism, different shop setup and everything. So mm -hmm. we decided we'd go back to our massive pieces and monuments and signs and things like that. Yeah, a more uh, comfortable. With. So if you 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 have a generally uh, on on average a three hundred mile radius, so people within three hundred miles will mm -hmm. often drive here to shop with you, or no, a lot of internet now. Mm -hmm. People would we have. Uh, people drive from Amarillo, Oklahoma City. Of course, now we have a store in Oklahoma City and one in Stillwater, so that kind of uh, separates that out a little bit. But uh, we get a lot of people from the Panhandle of Texas. Um, but you'd be surprised how much of our work is through the internet. It's family, it's children that have moved to California. Their mother or grandmother was buried in Eric or you know Mango or wherever, and they need to get something for that. So that's been a big the internet has been amazing. Um, uh, we don't have, uh, there's some companies now that are just strictly internet, but they leave it up to the family to figure out how to get it installed usually and how to get it placed. And we do all that unless uh, the family has another you know, situation that they need to, that they can take care of, how they can take care of it. So we don't do just internet sales, you know. Uh, it's more of a personal thing than just clicking here and saying, I oh, want this name here. <laughs> you know, they had the click and, click and buy. Um, but the internet's really helped tremendously. I mean, I, it's amazing. We'll get calls from all over. Uh, and, it, and it, it always amazes me that a lot Probably 75% of the time it's for something in Oklahoma <laughs> that they live off in Ohio. So that's interesting. Things change. Um, when did you open the stores in Stillwater in Oklahoma City? Oklahoma City was in 2001. Not good timing. 9-11 coming and everything. It, it was just kind of hard, but uh, it's really a strong store. Stillwater um, was actually 50 years from the, when we left the water, when I came down here, so that was two years ago. Uh, well, this is the second year, so 2014. 2014, I've lost a year. <laughs> 
2014, September of 2014 is when we put that in. So, uh, but it was, it, and we didn't even plan it that way. It's just um, we had uh, some family that really wanted, thought that they wanted to be a part of the family business, and they seemed to have the right personality to be able to run an, a sales office and everything. And the perfect place came up that we thought it was on Sixth Street, and it just seemed, it just seemed to fit. You know, we'd looked for years, different towns and everything, but that just really seemed to fit. So um, I was just really thrilled. My dad, he passed away in um, uh, October of 2014, but in June was his 90th birthday, and we took him to Stillwater to have a family gathering up there, and he was able to, we took him in his wheelchair, and he got to see the, the site where we were going to have our office, and it was exactly 50 years from the time we left Stillwater. So that was really an uh, emotional time. That was really cool. He had his 90th birthday. He got to see we were going back to Stillwater, and he was excited. He, was, he didn't get to come to the open house, which made us kind of sad, but uh, he was wanting to. <laughs> he was really, he was up on it, let me tell you. But uh, anyway, so that was really cool. We were able to do that. <laughs> And it, it seems to be working out pretty well, so we're we're happy with it. That's good. Why well, yeah. sixth and what? Sixth. Uh, it's at. Um, <laughs> I can tell you where it's before you cross the railroad tracks. It's across from the tire. Um, I must say, I forget the dang address all the time. Yeah, it's like uh, it's over there East by three hundred six East Thick Street or something like that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's east a, of Husbands and yeah, all that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's across from the tire place. Yeah. yeah, before you get to the railroad tracks. Um, but anyway, it was just, and what was really cool is the people that uh, had originally bought, uh, built that store were friends of my dad's. We didn't know that. When we had our open house, tons of people came in. Well, your dad did this, or your dad did that, or your mom did this, or your mom did that. I had no clue that there would even still be people up there that would even remember the name. Mm -hmm. But some people never thought we'd laugh. That was the funny part. I mean, they'd come in and go, oh, well, you used to be over on... <laughs> and we're going, that was a few years ago. <laughs> He's coming to visit. It's like old home week. It's really great. I mean, it, it's, it really is the same feeling from here to there, uh, the, the people. They're just so... I mean, uh, who would do that, go into a monument place and go... How's your dad do? <laughs> I mean, you know, come on. Uh, after 50 years. So, anyway, it is really, it's really been a neat experience. The girls that are up there, they say, oh, someone came in and they were just talking about how they, they used to come over mom and dad, your mom and dad, grandma and grandpa's house. <laughs> Great grandma and grandpa's house. That's how, many, how far oh. removed it is. And uh, anyway, it's wow. just been a really, we've been really welcomed up there. It's been nice. That's very cool. It sounds like you're, your parents would have been there for 20, 20 years? Yeah. 20 yeah. 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 Uh huh. Yep. That that is was my... Anyway. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Go figure. Yeah, you know, the, the house that I was uh, right and born to and everything that uh, I had wandered out in the street one day, so Dad put this uh, aluminum fence up where you couldn't climb out of it or anything. And it's about, it looks like a stocking fence, but it's aluminum. <laughs> it's, Six feet tall. I mean, it's tall. It seems tall. It's probably not that tall. It's still there. <laughs> so I know why that fence is in the yard. I ended up out on uh, what street was well, I can't even think of the name of the street now. Uh, we lived on 9th. Ninth. Ninth. Anyway. It sounds like he knew um, to watch out for that because it sounds like he was also that child. Yeah. <laughs> and he couldn't tie me to the front porch without getting in trouble. I'm sure. Yeah, I, yeah, it was definitely uh, passed down through the generations. <laughs> <laughs> I hope this is something what you wanted because I this is I mean this has been fun. I hope you're getting something I you do. can use. Oh yeah, I, well yes. So what's what it, what I've taken away from this and what I think there's multiple threads that are interesting, but um, as much about sort of like how you come to university and how you discover what you want to do and how that ties in with your background and then what you. Well, yeah, you know, you've done really interesting things with it. I mean, yeah. you've obviously branched out from just ge geology. You've mm -hmm. mastered business. You've mastered communication. There's a lot of things. Right. Yes. Yeah. 
It, it is, and like I said, I had so many, I couldn't pinpoint one thing that I wanted to do. And, and um, down here, you know, I wasn't a concert pianist, but I played for church, and I have for years and years, and then it revol evolved into, now I kind of help lead the singing. <laughs> I mean, there's different things that have pushed me. Um, uh, one of the grad one of the alumni from OSU suggested me to be a regent at WSC, and so I was a re served as a regent. Well, who would have thought? <laughs> My professors are probably going, who? <laughs> no, but it was one of the best things I've ever done. It was a challenge, but it was it was interesting to see the concepts of how I mean how things evolve in a college setting. Mm -hmm. You know, how those decisions are made and how it affects the students and how it affects the teachers and, the, and everything like that. So it's, uh, yeah, it's been a whirlwind. I mean, it's been a yeah. pretty neat, neat journey. When were you regent down there? In all uh, the things right back there. Oh, I'm sorry. 19, uh, uh, nah. Eight, 96. 96, thank you. Yeah. It was I'm, late 90s. I'm a foot away from it if I yeah, can't thank read that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should remember, but yeah, it was. Uh, it's really cool. That yeah. is cool. Yeah. Yeah, that is. It's a big shift, right? From yes. <laughs> yeah, from being a little bashful girl from Granite. Um, but it it really did. It uh, when we came back when we came back here, uh, we were we been involved in everything from one end to the other. Right now, I'm on the planning committee for town. Mm -hmm. and uh, It's a lot of grand yeah. memorials in town. A lot of memorials yeah. <laughs> in town. I noticed that. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, and then um, I'm on the uh, Educational Enrichment Foundation here at the school, so that gets a little, you know, uh, makes me feel like we're making contributions there. So, you know, little things in a little town. Mm -hmm. But, hey, it's, uh, there's some good people here, and they work hard. Uh, We've had some bad, good, indifferent times, but all in all, there's just some really good people that work hard and try to keep things uh, motivating for a small town. Yeah. What's the population <laughs> of Granite? Good question. Uh, we have on our board, it says 1,600, but the reformatory is included in that, so we're a little over 1,000 probably. Mm -hmm. Population. The county's about five thousand, a little under five thousand actually. Um, so um, you know, there's a lot to do <laughs> to keep things going. Um, and then for fun, we ride bikes whenever I don't have a broken foot and we don't have other obligations. So it's kind of nice to do that out in the open spaces. There's plenty of that. Yes. <laughs> yes. So. Can you still go and climb around the quarry? Or around the mountain. I, yes, yeah, we actually have a road that goes up there. Mm -hmm. And before before this, I I try to get up there, you know, three or four for exercise. You know, climb and play and look around. And it's just beautiful up there. If it hadn't rained, I'd take you up there because but the road's a little iffy at the moment. Uh, it's just a beautiful view. You can see to Lake Luke. You can see that the Quartz Mountain area, and you can see south of town to the flatlands, and it's just a gorgeous place. It's um, I like going up. That's my calming place. I go up there and kind of hang that. out. Yeah. Do you know how what the elevation is up there? How high is it? Four hundred feet. I mean, it's not. You know, it's, uh, the height of it. Mm -hmm. The elevation. Mm -hmm. like, that's okay. Know. I just yeah. curious. Oh, Four hundred feet. That <laughs> yeah. was really well. That's pretty. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, I think that's that was the bulk of what I wanted to talk about. Is there anything <laughs> else that you wanted to share that you wanted to comment on? Ask. Whatever. Not that I can think of at the moment. <laughs> I think we have covered every. I have. I'm surprised at the directions we have, <laughs> which is fun. I enjoy. I like. I like uh, talking about uh, how mom and dad met and everything. I think that's cool. But yeah, I wish. I wish you was just uh, ingrained in our hearts from mm -hmm. day one. Uh, born, born in Stillwater. Where else would you go? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know that does lend some. Family. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I do have one more question. Uh -huh. Bringing up your mom and your dad meeting. Mm -hmm. Um. So, if your mother was half Creek, you yes. said correct. Uh -huh. Are you close to that side of the family? Is yeah. there is there sort of like a Creek legacy that you still feel yes. part of? How is that built yeah. into your family? Yeah, definitely. Well. 
the way that Mother has double cousins, or and also um, some of her first cousins are my age, and Karen's age, and my sister's ages, and everything. So we grew up like cousin cousin. I mean, we grew up really close. We would go up there for, um, you know, of course, the usuals, weddings and funerals and everything. But we'd go and have Thanksgiving together. In fact, our cousin, her, her cousin, our set, our down the road cousin, <laughs> actually has a Thanksgiving every year. Invites everybody. Everybody. Over in Dustin? <laughs> yes. And just recently, it's been really cool. You know, because we get, all of us went our separate ways and then we all came back. Well, we're a little distance-wise, we're a little ways from there. We'd always keep up with, um, you know, with everybody. But here recently, uh, we all went back and went to the Native Church and took part in that and took uh, made it some... Um, uh, contribution and memory of mom and dad to the church and everything. So that's been really cool and we hope to be able to do more of that now. Mm -hmm. uh, obligations kind of kept us from being able to take part in everything but it's been, yeah, it's been a part of our life all along. Mm -hmm. And our cousins on that side of the family have always been like brothers and sisters instead of cousins. And I guess that's because mother, mother was the they called her the bell cow, <laughs> uh, uh, or at least the guy that was trying to lease their property called her the bell cow. Whatever she did, everybody would fall. Mm -hmm. But she she was all she was the one that would always have the big dinners for everybody, and we would all get together and uh, we stayed close. I mean, it's just that's just the way it is. And uh, the the native ceremonies and everything, we try to incorporate that a lot of it in mom's funeral and dad's funeral. Um, we had a cousin uh, that's now passed away, but he'd blow the horn to bring everybody in for the service. And um, then we, uh, at the Awathali, they'd have a wake, more or less, and they'd have the, the native church there would be set up and had an arbor. And you, the body would be in state for three days, and you'd go in all, all for the whole three days, you'd go in and out, and have food there and everything. When Mother passed away, I asked our church if we could possibly just have her at the church and have everything there and not have to go to the funeral home or whatever. And that allowed us to have that send off for her where she was in home. She was at home there, mm -hmm. you know. She wasn't in some strange room elsewhere. And so we were able to do that and to, to decorate with, with things that meant something to her and the family. It was really important to me to have her brothers and sisters equal with us in the church just because, I mean, the closeness of that family is just, you know, mm -hmm. it's unbelievable. And, I, and in this day and age, I guess it's just, there's a lot of fragmented families. They move off to Timbuktu and everything, but these, this family has just really stayed so close together. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, anyway. Well, and I think that's interesting because of the sort of the ending up at a boarding school and then sort of the siblings being yeah. scattered a little bit that, yeah. that they were able to regroup and yeah, it's really it was amazing actually I would think, uh, but that's what they held on to, you know that was their they'd come back, they all live in the Stillwater region, some one in Newkirk, Tulsa, and Stillwater, you know. And uh, when they moved down here, they asked Mother if she was crazy because there wasn't any trees. <laughs> you know, what are you thinking? But uh, anyway, it's, uh, uh, they held on to each other through some horrible times. And uh, that was family. I mean, that's just, that's what they did. But it's really, I'm so thankful that we have our... Uh, we still have the family campgrounds at the at the church, the Wathley, and they have um, the five cabin, which was my grandmother's name. And um, you know, even though we never met her, you know, we were able to to be a part of her sisters and families and brothers' families. So that kind of brought us a little idea of what she would have been like. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Bless your heart. It's cool. We did that with coughing. Um, uh, yeah, I was. I was. I. I meant to ask that early on. We just. 
to skip to another part. That's mm -hmm. that's interesting. Did did she um, carry into the language with her? You know, she did for a long time. Her grandmother didn't speak English. The grandma that raised mom and the kids, uh, the she would not speak English. So they grew up in a bilingual environment. Uh, now, whenever they all went their separate ways, now it's it's becoming a uh, a desire to relearn. And some of our younger cousins uh, are actually. Uh, studying the language and actually using it more than as the middle generations here. Mm -hmm. So a lot of uh, mother, I had always thought Shilako kind of kept them from pursuing their native stuff, but I was corrected at mother's funeral because it's the, and I guess it was a mix of stories and then, and, you know, you hear things in, in history, how things are portrayed in history and everything. Mm -hmm. But Shalaka was one of the only ones, at least later in, in the later years especially, to allow them to keep their heritage and to pursue learning, keeping the language and everything, which was something I learned. But um, I forgot where I was going with that. Mother? The language. The language. She was able to keep that. Yes. She knew words, especially whenever she wanted us to hear. <laughs> we, we heard words come out that were seemed normal to us and they were actually Creek words that she was telling us to hurry up. Do you understand? <laughs> hurry up! <laughs> and things like that. But uh, they are relearning it. The other cousins are relearning it. I forgot what I was going to tell you. But anyway, it'll come back down. Maybe. So who told you, who corrected you about the the school when you were at the funeral? An aunt, um, an aunt I had written out a little bio. I know what it was. Mother, over the years, had been ridiculed. She had been talked down to. She had been ostracized. She had been, uh, you know, for being an Indian. Uh, even when she had, <laughs> she had uh, the first three kids, she was at a PTA meeting and holding my brother and had my other sister by the hand and someone came up and asked her who she was a nanny for because they were white and she was Indian and so she had she had run into that all her life and not that she wanted she definitely didn't want to forget where she was from but it just was easier to become a little more Anglo than, <laughs> than not you know just to kind of survive but she would go back, she would send things to Theo Wadsley, she would go back to, to Dustin and, and take part in everything. But it was just really, it was, she, had a, she had a hard time, uh, you know, over the years, prejudices. Do you think it was a, a problem with uh, whenever she and your dad started dating? Did they ever talk about that? Dad didn't care. She was beautiful. Oh, he thought she was, she, she was, she was a beautiful lady. <laughs> most beautiful woman on the face of the earth. And uh, there were some little quips that came from some family members, you know, uh, as that happened. But there was a little, and there was the other way too. He was an amputee. What do you think, Why? you know, there, he had he had his own, uh, there were prejudices put to, towards him, even though you really couldn't tell he was an amputee when he had his prosthesis on him and he, he operated Fine. He had a cane that he used sometimes when he was younger, but, uh, you know, the, I think they both, I think that might have been something that drew them together as well, because they both had undergone criticism and, you know, prejudices based on their, his disability, or which is what some people would call it, and there, you wouldn't have, his personality overcame every, <laughs> all of that, and Mother, she, she she was a tough lady. She was she moved on and got away. I mean, she she made a life that anybody would be proud of, especially coming from her and her whole family. Her whole family and all her alumni at Chilaco, they are very very. Uh, <laughs> I lost my word again. They've all made good things with their lives. Their mm -hmm. lives have have come to wonderful ends, fruition, and uh, it's amazing. 
when you think of everything those people that they went through all those years, mm -hmm. you know, how they ended up at Shilako and and they're close, so close. The the native the her fam her Shilako family, some of them came to her funeral as well. I mean, mother was eighty six, <laughs> so yeah, that's quite a quite a statement. Some people that work for mom and dad at Stillwater came to the service. It was just amazing. <laughs> well, they were just wondering what they were doing down here in Grand. Yeah, I guess, yeah, right, right. <laughs> Oh, heavens. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, it, it really is everything I had, I swear. Um, unless there really, unless there's anything else that um, came out of that that is, you know, sort of going on in your brain. I'm... Oh, there's lots of it. No, it's been fun. I appreciate y'all giving the opportunity to tell our little story. Oh, it's nothing little about it. Well, it's uh, unusual. We always thought that um, if anyone could take Grandpa's when he came from Tennessee, his journey and all the way up, it'd be an interesting docudrama. <laughs> yeah. Or a soap opera, one of the two. But uh, it's, um, I don't know, we think it's unique. I'm sure everybody has their unique stories that they like about their family. So.